Come on, isn't our God good? Come on, let's just put our hands together one more time. Isn't our God good? Our God is so real, and our God is so strong, and our God wants to show us his great strength and the great love of our God. And if you don't know God's strength and God's presence, it's here. It's here today. I love it. I love it. And we praise him until we sense his presence. We know that God is everywhere. So it makes, so sometimes it's hard to, to see the sense it makes. We say, stop by here, Lord, because the Lord is everywhere. But the Lord wants to pour into us and the Lord wants to pour over us in such mighty ways. In such mighty ways. And he wants us to understand that he is truth. And he is life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, can we just thank the Lord one more time for the musicians and for the singers? That was just... <laughs> And for the children, they were singing their hearts out. Man, I love hearing the young children singing and, and, and lifting their voices um, to the Lord. And uh, I was standing back in the corner. Well, that was that was Eli leading, wasn't it? That was so. That was so. He was singing out with some boldness. I appreciate that so much. And who was that little noisy girl? <laughs> Who was, who was that little lady? Oh, my goodness. Huh. 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 I'm telling you. Listen. 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 Wait. Rocky. Rocky in here? Rocky, where are you? Mm, he better not have left. Lord, anoint that little baby to get him in the name of Jesus. All right. There you go, Jesus. Oh, I felt that. I felt that. Listen, it's so good. Listen, it's just really good to be in the Lord's house and to bless him. I just, I appreciate the beauty and the strength of, um, of our worship team because we wanted to do something um, so powerful during African American History Month to make sure we bring that truth of those songs and of the God's visitation to those folks to everyone. That's what we're really trying to do. We're really trying to take what we believe God was giving a group of people who were distraught and gave them a song, a melody, um, a word that was really to enrich and to bless the world. And so please feel that you don't have to sit back, nor should you sit back when we're praising God about these historic facts. Because when we're singing um, to God and about God, that's the God for everyone. The God for everyone. And I just appreciate you all really, um, really grabbing this and really, and really holding on to it. All right. I just want to, I want to just talk for a few minutes. I want to encourage you for just a few minutes. Um, and then just have us, just have a time of prayer that God continues to strengthen our hearts and to continue to bring, to bring healing in our hearts. We've been talking about the systemic, systemic impact of, um, of what racism has done, but how it has not choked out the truth and the power of God and how God stands with those who are broken and distressed. That's what the passage in Isaiah was talking about today. Um, that God is present to those who have been shut out of avenues and opportunities, not because God loves some more than others, but because God wants to bring grace to all. He wants to really, really be great, you know, bring grace to all. And so, you know, I, it's, it's, when you're pastoring on tough texts like these, um, it's, it's, you do all this preliminary stuff. So let me just try to do this real quickly to get into it. But, um, in a lot of places, we don't talk about what keeps us apart. And that's why I think um, the church is limited. The church with Big C, the church of Jesus Christ, is really limited. I believe that God wants us to be a house of all nations. But I think we have not talked through, prayed through, and worked through the things that keep us separate. And so it's really, really, really tough um, to get through here. I really appreciate um, my brothers um, um, who many times are brought up, particularly white men, men of European descent. Um, when we're talking about these issues of these systems. And I think it's because we have not been mentored or tutored out of them or through them. We don't know how to pray. We don't understand the beauty of what God has done in our midst. We, we hinder, we're hindered from celebrating it, and we're hindered from really experiencing God's, God's greatness inside of us. And so I really, I really appreciate it because actually 
some of these brothers are the folks who've helped me to wrestle with some of these theological insights, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, um, I'm just going to put a couple of brothers on the spot for just a minute. And, and, and I'm saying this because they've been in inner circles with me. But, um, but you know what I really appreciate um, about our partnership and our friendship, Pastor Kevin, is that even as God has brought you to this church from 25, 26 years ago, yeah. um, he has never pretended like he's not part or representative of something systemically that has happened. He's never come in and tried to pretend that he's someone he's not. Yeah. And it's actually helped me to get language and not back away from some of what, some of what has, has happened. Um, and God uses it mightily. In fact, this chair up here, um, um, I was supposed to sit and preach in it because I was having, <laughs> they came in the room to pray for me and I couldn't walk. My back tightened up. I had a, anyway, my back was bothering me today and I thought I was going to have to preach sitting down. And, um, and the, brothers were, the brothers were praying for me. And, um, and just praying that God would really, just, that God would begin to, to you know, to touch me. And, um, and, and I was having some pain really in my lower back. And so sometimes you're like, okay, I don't want to pray on my friend's lower back. I don't want to put my hand on low. Listen, these brothers prayed for me. All over. But you know what? I felt God's hand touch me. Really, when I came in, they were in, I, I didn't have my shoes on. Um, um, I wasn't walking right. And them brothers came in and ministered to me. But I'm just, I'm saying this because I'm just, just the fearlessness that you have in many times of going in places where it's not comfortable, but God really wants you to, 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 to be. But the liberty, God, that you've experienced, the liberty, the liberty that, that um, God has given you to model what it means to be a servant is very, very powerful. Um, I'm, I'm saying this because some folks in here are thinking, you've been beating up on the white brothers. And, um, and so I was thinking about just backing off today. Psych. Give her, no, I can't. <laughs> um, and, and, um, but I just said it because I just felt a healing release in my back. I praise God for you brothers who pray for me. I thank God that healing still works. I was supposed to be sitting down preaching today. And as I walked up, I wasn't even sure I was going to be able to make it up the steps. And I just felt God's healing and his power in doing that. Brother, Brother Paul Grant, you guys have not asked for doing this. Um, but there were times where I was working through grad school. And I was reading texts that were just way, way over my head. And we would go have coffee, and we would process stuff. And I always tease Brother Paul because I think, he has a, because I think you have a brilliant mind. And I don't say that to embarrass you, but when we sit down and we have those talks and those discussions, it was speaking with a brilliant man that I realized that I have dumbed down my brilliance for decades. And so I can't honor what God used you to pull out of me without honoring that I see that inside of you. And in that text, in those places, you helped me to believe that I belonged in the academy, that I had something to say, something very practical that was very powerful. But he, too, taught me it is a gift to be a man of European descent in a ministry that keeps traditions that are modeled after America's first real multi-ethnic church. And so these brothers and others, I can't, you know, I, I, would, I would put probably Brett on spot today. I don't see him today. Um, He's downstairs with the children, having chaired our board for years. So I'm just saying, I want you all to know this, who are hearing these things. It's not throwing off on these folks, but what I'm saying is, it's really meant to be a point of liberty, to bring people out of a system that they don't understand in order so that they can really experience the power of God. I hope that's making sense, is it? Pretend like it is. No, really, is that making sense? And so I want to say to folks, particularly those who are not African American, I've asked people like Pastor Kevin, Brother Paul, and others, um, to we're planning on some discussions because folks have got to talk through this. This is systemic stuff that's held the church apart and separate, and we're really breaking it down. And we've got to wrestle through it because I believe that we're going to be a model of folks doing this. We have to understand how systems work, or we just perpetuate wrong, even wrongness. And we're not multi ethnic because we're all warehoused together. When we understand how much we have fought to be the people of God and to be together, we understand how great God's power is to us is to us. Um, now, later on, as we get through the series, I'm going to show you that these systemic things are not just pertinent to the United States, that there have been systemic um, injustices around the world. 
and we're going to talk about that soon. But the reason I talk about the one in America is because it's the one that really holds us down, and it's one we haven't really, we haven't really talked about. And once we understand the rules, we can become a force to be reckoned with. When I was in high school, um, I was a track athlete. I wasn't on the level of my wife because um, she got her whole college paid for by running. And, um, but I held my own, at least for this area. You know, Madison's a smaller market than Chicago, where she's from. And I remember I anchored the, the, the city championship mile relay, and we broke a record that year for the most points granted to a track team. Like 100 years we had broken that record. But let me tell you, I had to learn how the system worked. When they were teaching me how to run relays in middle school, I didn't understand it. So they told me to stand on a line, and my teammate was coming with me with a baton. When he got about 20 feet from me, I took off running because I thought I was racing him. <laughs> you, you may not really believe this, but there was a day in time I wasn't that cool. I wasn't always as cool as I am now. <laughs> it's why I love uncool people, because it's the skin I live in. It's just that when enough people know uncool people, they're still uncool. They just become popularly uncool. Some of y'all will get what I'm saying on your way home. Because I knew enough of the off people, and they outnumbered the on people. But I never stopped really being geeky or awkward. But when I saw that boy come around that corner in that gym class, I took off. And listen, listen, kids are brutal. They were crying. They were, I was rolling on the floor. I was like, what? I won. I can't believe the stuff I divulge. You know, y'all, some of y'all better get saved and delivered and right because bearing your soul up in front of folks like y'all ain't easy. <laughs> but the gym teacher, Mr. Steph, is a come here. <laughs> <Just come here. laughs> um, and explain to me the rules. So I understood that my teammates were not my enemies. He taught me principles that helped me to become pretty good at what I was doing and to hone my craft, to be able to hold my own, um, to be a part of teams that set records. But had he not corrected that, I would have still been thinking that those of my teammates were my enemies. I address these issues of systemic reality because if we don't understand the rules, we don't break out of them. And we think that people who are our teammates are our enemies. And we race them rather than getting a baton from them in order to complete a task. We're racing with people who are not your competition. We're on the same team, and God has really, really blessed us. And so I think I can only get as far as the first part of this message. In Jesus' passage in Luke 4, and also in Isaiah's passage in Isaiah 61. In Isaiah... They were trying to preach to God's people who are experiencing the hand of God because they have forgotten their God. And so God told them, you know the story that if you don't follow me, I'm going to let your enemies come and do some stuff to you. But when you cry back out to me, I'm going to bring you back. But Isaiah's prophesying, he's getting a word from God that one day God's going to come back and restore his people. And even though we have been obedient, disobedient, God would restore his people and give them hope. So when Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 in, in, in Luke chapter 4. When he reads it and he stands up in the, in the synagogue in Nazareth where he was brought up, he said the spirit, he, they handed him the scroll of Isaiah. Jesus didn't say, we don't even know if he asked for it. They gave him the scroll of Isaiah, but he unrolled it and found the place where it's now Isaiah 61. He stood up and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. To bring liberty to the captives. He, you can read this whole thing. To bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom of the captives. To release the darkness of the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on those the crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. He goes on and on and on. But one of the things that we miss in reading this passage. Is that Jesus was quoting Isaiah's discussion. About healing one individual from pain. What Isaiah was talking about is the same thing that Jesus was quoting, that he came to break systems that put people at odds with each other. This is different, so I want you all to pray and take a deep breath and stay with me. Because in our part of the world, we have made faith so personalized. 
It's about me finding Jesus, my getting the Holy Ghost, my getting a touch, my getting a healing. And we are so detached from the people in the body and the people from around the world that we don't understand that God has blessed you to be a blessing. The greatest temptation to the church is being blessed because the church doesn't realize why you have been blessed. You have been blessed in order to do a blessing. Why am I talking about this today? Because when you forget that you've been blessed to be a blessing, you then use the blessing to dominate others and not liberate each other. Here's how I know Jesus does not hate rich people. He says, Zacchaeus, I need to stay in your house. He knew illegal activity built that house. Cheating and lying built that house. Jesus didn't always stay at Airbnb and Motel 6. Sometimes he slept on monogram pillows. And he drank from goblets with gold and diamonds on them. Listen up because I don't have a lot of time. But what Jesus hates is not rich people. It's the sense that I am rich. And here's what's really weird. Everybody in here has a different idea of what rich is. And I can name you 12 people think every one of you is rich. What this keyboard costs is more than what some of my friends in South Africa make in a whole year. What some of us have spent on our glasses is more than what they make in a year. They eat less food than we will throw away this week. So here's the trap of wealth. Nobody even really knows who gets there. When I told my financial planner years ago, when I was in my early 20s, that when I retire, I want to be rich, he said, how much is rich? That was one of the best financial questions someone ever asked me. Because I didn't know, which meant he saved me from spending my whole life thinking I was becoming something that I might already have. Because if you don't announce or understand that God has given you something, he's brought you to a particular place, then you don't think you have to share. It's interesting to me because part of my work is raising money in other churches. It's funny the churches that don't think that they're wealthy. Fountain of Life doesn't think it's wealthy. <laughs> Y'all thought I was going to talk about some rich white churches, didn't you? Y'all was just y'all thought I was gonna talk about Black Hawk, didn't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm gonna get him later. But I talked to one church and they'll say, and they said this to me, our church is not a wealthy church. Yeah, 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 we've got CEOs, but the church downtown has the people who own the companies. Because you know, you can be a CEO and not own the companies. No matter where you go, there's somebody else richer. Somebody else that's got more. You know what that means? Nobody else has to do anything with what they have. Stay, stay with me because I'm going to help somebody. But understanding what you have, it then makes you responsible, responsible for sharing it with somebody else. I'm going to give an example that my mother said that I think translates to finances. The Bible says that you should not call anybody a fool. My mom is my Sunday school teacher now. It may, she might have tied the wrong scriptures together biblically, but theologically, I think she made a point. She, here's the point. Because growing up, if you call somebody a fool, that was, you could get a whooping. I don't know if anybody else would like that, but if I call somebody a fool, that was cussing. If I said lie instead of story, and if I call somebody a fool, that was, anybody else had that? You couldn't say the word fool. I needed, wait. Only black, okay, Jeremy, thank you. Thank you. All right, Jeremy, I almost went to, thank you, thank you for that. But here's what my mom said. My mom said that you shouldn't call anybody a fool because the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. If that fool is around you, you should have convinced him that there is a God so that you should not be around fools because foolish people ought to become wise because of your life. That was my Sunday school teacher. My mama told me that. Okay, I'm going to talk fast. I don't want to be late for the, for, the, for the children's program. What she said was, okay, we know you ain't supposed to call nobody a fool. Because the Bible says the fool is said in his heart there is no God. So my mother's thinking a fool is someone who does not know God. She said you ought to live for God so tough that the fool drops their foolishness and accepts God. That a fool should not be fooled when they come in touch with you. 
God's idea is that some of you have great education because someone who's unlearned should become better because of being around you. But guess what? You become better because of your students. Ask folks who teach. Minister Carlotta, you taught on a collegiate level. Pastor Kevin has. Brother Paul, you have the things you learn from your students, the things that students say. The same is true for those of us who have resources. God's thought that we would have enough sense to think, I'm smart, but I ain't this smart. I'm good, but I'm not this this good. We have forgotten that God has blessed us in order to be a blessing. Y'all got kind of quiet on that one. Because we're thinking that we're on the receiving end and somebody ought to see me and pull me up and give it no consideration to who you're supposed to pull up. I guarantee if you start pulling people up, God will give you what you need. I need, I need y'all to hear me because th- what we're beginning to shape is our attitude towards why we reach outside. When Jesus is saying this, and over the next couple of weeks, this might throw my March preaching off, but I might have to extend it for just a bit. What Jesus is saying in essence when he's quoting Isaiah in Luke 4 is that I am here to break systemic reality, systemic oppression. Now, that's not what we usually talk about in church. And here's what's really dark. We gave it a name social gospel so that it would have no power. So we call it social gospel so that it would say to those who preach the gospel gospel that this ain't really the saving gospel. Can I tell you why we say that? Because one of the greatest agents that the enemy has used to oppress the world has been Christianity who have misused scripture to put people in bondage. So the world thought that it was spiritual to go to Africa and get slaves to Christianize them. Read the Old Testament. They would send white itinerant preachers to preach to the slaves and guess what the messages were? Stop breaking tools. Stop lying. Servants, obey your masters. Do you know what gave rise to black preachers on plantations? They had enough Holy Ghost to them to realize that is propaganda, and I'm not going to listen to that. There's no power in that. I'm not going to listen to that mess. And so they started preaching. Who's some, who some seasoned people? I'm not going to say old. Who's some seasoned people? Brother George, you probably remember this. Minister Collada, you might. Do you remember in the back in the days when preachers would preach? And they would say, today I'm going to preach from Isaiah 61. Who's got Isaiah 61? Who's got, who's got the Bible open to it? Y'all come to Bible church without no Bible? Yeah. Minister Collada, how did they used to read? Remember how they used to read? They would say, the pastor would find a good reader. He would say, okay, I wonder, today I'm going to be preaching from Isaiah 61. You got it, Minister Collada? Yeah. Read. <laughs> Hold it right there. The spirit of the sovereign Lord. Not a wishy-washy, Lord, but the sovereign Lord. Read. Stop right there, daughter. Stop right there. Because he has anointed me. Now, her job was to put me in the key I preach in. So that Brother George over here would understand that whatever she's reading in, she knew to read because I preach in A flat. Where is that? Y'all think I'm making this stuff up. Listen. But do you know why that happened? Because she could read. And I couldn't. But I could hear what thus saith the Lord. You know why? You know why I could hear from God? What does Isaiah 61 and 1 say? I might not be able to reach, but I can preach it up in here. I'm trying, to take, I'm trying to take y'all somewhere. So she could read. I might not be able to read that well, but I've been processing it and hearing from God because I was tired of people going around telling me to obey my master. My master is Jesus. What you talking about? My master is God Almighty. What you talking about? My master is the Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? My master is this level of power. And so because the preaching was to keep you in place and push you down, it happened to even people like Jesus who were born under Roman colonialism, who were suppressed by the Roman government, they were pressed down and had no power. 
And so when Jesus walked and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to set the captives free. He did not say, I came to get your son out of prison. Can I, ch- can I just translate for you? He was not saying, I'm coming to help make bail. He said, I'm coming to fix the rig system that makes your community get more police than anybody else. I'm going to make somebody mad, but I'm going to tell the truth today. He's not just saying, I'm coming to just help your family. I'm coming to undo the system that is making this money, making this stuff on folks. When people understand it's a system, stay with me, people, I want to help you. And it's working to set people free. Pastor Kevin told me something years ago that I didn't want to believe. And last week, a friend of mine who is a hedge fund manager, he, he invests in New York. He's a brother. Those of you who have been around for a while, he used to work for InterVarsity years ago. But he's a very successful fundraiser in New York. He sent me a list about the investment portfolios of privately held prisons. Do you know what group is pulling their portfolio out of that investment? A group that Pastor Kevin told me about 10 years ago. Teachers' pensions. He told me that, and I said, I'm not going to get up there and tell people who in the education field that their retirement is tied up in privatized prisons that are categorically full of black boys, not even black men, black boys who are spending their childbearing years in prison. That's, no, you can't, I, no. Now, out the blue, my friend sends me this data, and California's pulling out. Other places are pulling out because they realize there's a system here. Could the people who keep kids educated be making money off of kids who don't make it? Now, this is really costly, so I want y'all just to, <sighs> Yes. I didn't want to believe, and it's not just them, but think about it. Folks work for the state. You don't know who's investing your money. Now, Brother Peter, people like you do because you do it for a living. But folks don't know. You're just working for, you're just working for your retirement. You work for the city. You work for the county. You work for Madison College. You don't understand that someone is actually, I really think that you should invest in this fund because we can guarantee you pretty good occupancy. And we're teaching men and women good transferable skills so that once they come out of prison, (laughs) good luck, once they come out of prison. But when the light came on, folks in other states started asking, where's our money? Where's our money? Where's our money? But you know what they're trying to do? They're now trying to pull out because of shame, but they're also trying to bankrupt a corrupt system. Do you think churches aren't investing in those funds? Stop looking sideways at teachers. Stop looking. We haven't even asked that question yet. We're like, oh my gosh, teachers. Oh my gosh, teachers. So, Pastor Kevin, you're going to retire on the backs of black and you've asked the church. But let me tell you something. The non Christian managers of the teachers' funds in California pulled out. What is the church pulled out of? I researched. Correction Corporation of America. Am I saying that right? The CEO of it is a Christian from Tennessee. It's one of my European brothers of European descent. And he's testifying. He's also a Sunday school teacher in his church. And he talks about how he presents this portfolio because it's helping to make our communities safer. And we're teaching people great skills because if they just lived in the streets, they wouldn't really have any of these skills. It is headed by a brother. It is headed by somebody who goes to church. I'm not about to mess with Christianity. I'm not about to judge anybody, but the Bible says, you know, a tree by its fruit. And I just think if you start selling people, that's kind of anti-Christian. <laughs> now some of y'all know why I'm angry. But listen, let me tell you something. Why am I dropping this on you? Because <laughs> the Holy Ghost is making me? Because the work of the church is to call out these systemic realities. 
Folks are agnostic and atheist because they've seen the ineffectiveness of the church and its silence on these issues. Don't let your sons and daughters go to prison and they're black because they're going to come out following Israel of God. Am I saying that right? Hebrew of God, black Israelites, nation of Islam, because the church has been afraid to name the sin. The church has been afraid to call it out. And black leaders in multi-ethnic churches are afraid to say it because we might make our non-black people mad. I'm not trying to make people feel good. I'm trying to get people free. Because if we don't know this reality, we participate like we didn't know. Now, somebody's going to get less of a return than what they were getting in that fund. But some teachers, some people are saying, I would rather get less of a return than to think that some of the boys that I'm teaching, I'm now making my retirement on their banks. I can't live with That's not why I went into teaching. But here's what's really sad. Who told him or her who's teaching fourth grade that they were entering into that evil system? They didn't even know they were. That's not even, this is the ugliness of the system because we don't even know. Now, some of you are thinking, I wish I didn't know. <laughs> right, Sherry? Some of you think, I wish I didn't know. So when Jesus says, I'm coming, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to restore sight. That didn't just mean, and I've studied the word, it doesn't just mean a physical healing. It means your outlook on life. He comes to build hope in people who are hopeless. He comes to people who think differently to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee. That's every 50 years where the people, God's people were told, give all your stuff back that you sold, that you bought, you got on eBay, you got on the, out of the pawn shop. You know good and well that person couldn't afford stuff, so they put their typewriter, their laptop in there. You went and bought it for $25. You know it's a $2,500 you know Apple, but guess what? At the 50th year, you gave stuff back to people because God wanted to set stuff even. The church have lost its effectiveness because we don't like the Jesus that breaks systems. We want a Jesus that makes us happy. We want a Jesus that takes us to heaven. But if the people who God has chosen don't set the captive free, we find ourselves fighting against the very Christ who comes to free people. Y'all got two more minutes in here? It's kind of warm. Do we need to blast the air? You okay? So what this has done for me is that it's made me think about not just the comfort of the church, but who are the folks sitting outside hungry and destitute and think that the church doesn't care? We've got probably 1,200 units across the street. We've never asked, what do you need? We've got a transfer point that's a place for fight, but we don't go down. We used to, what do you need? The church goes behind the prison bars to sing kumbaya to prisoners. And then don't you want them, don't want them to come to your church when they get out. Don't live in my neighborhood when you get out. And you sure as heck aren't going to work in a cubicle next to me or my daughter when you get out. And we have lost power because we have lost sight that Jesus came to break the systemic realities to bind up the broken heart to proclaim freedom to the captives I want to give one more example and you know we'll just pray after this team you don't have to because I know y'all are trying to figure out like what are the songs that we see they sit there trying to sing songs just um, don't even worry about it In the old days when people bought their meat from butchers, and not just from the deli, not just from the packaged meats, but they didn't go to the deli. If the butcher didn't like you, they could put their thumb on the scale. Anybody ever hear of this? And what does that mean when you put when you put your thumb on the scale? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? You're cheating them. Now, you take it off of the people you like. Put it on for the people you don't. But what does this do? What do you do with this thumb? You add more weight, but for what reason? Because you are illegally for profit 
but you are legally doing it in order to make one group poorer and another one richer. We completely ignore this, you all. When Proverbs 11 and 1 says, the Lord detests honest, dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. Proverbs 11 and 1. In the King James, it says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. We've got a very narrow view of what is abominable. We only think about a couple of things. We think about what's abominable. The Lord detested. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is to his delight. Proverbs 20 and 23, the Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please him. Micah 6, 11, do you expect me to overlook obscene wealth you piled up by cheating and fraud? Do you think I'm going to tolerate shady deals and shifting schemes? I'm tired of the violent rich bullying their way with bluffs and lies. I'm fed up. Beginning now, you're finished. You'll pay for your sins down to the last cent. In Micah, he's talking about unjust or unjust balances. We think it just means one butcher and one customer. It's talking about a system, a practice. System, according to, to, to definition, uh, the definition of a system is a set of things working together as a part of a mechanism or an interconnecting network. It's a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done, an organized scheme or method. It's an act of bias or a tactic of cheating which creates a situation that unfairly benefits one party involved in an interaction. Systems have been set up. We did it when we were colonializing. We did it when we were setting up this country. It's been done around the world in other places, but God got Israel so much when these systems happened. Why, why, why? Because people who are disheartened have a hard time finding God. And if we can help to free people from the prisons and from the systems, they can make their way with God. We want to tell people about Jesus. And we want them to break their prisons by themselves. Maybe we need to break prisons and allow them to meet Jesus as a result. Maybe we need to have come against these systems, systemic reality. Here's what's really tough about this. We're going to get to the good news soon. I can't do it all today. It's kind of like Easter weekend. You want to talk about the resurrection on Good Friday, but you got to let it just hang there for a minute. Israel was chosen so that God could build family with them in order to bring peace to the whole world. But when they systematically saw outsiders as outsiders, forgetting that they were called to bring them to God, they became a part of the system God was trying to break down. When the church ceases to understand that we've been called because we were few and not because we were great, we begin to dominate others and think of ourselves better, and then convince ourselves, well, they don't even want Jesus anyway, so I'm not going to present it. Because God is near the brokenhearted, because God is near the brokenhearted, the more we reach out, the more we will experience the people of God. When you free people who are in bondage, God will begin to free you. God will begin to free you. Can we pray? I'm going to get to some more of this next week. We don't need the anointing of God to have church. We need the anointing of God to break people out of systemic reality. Folks who don't know Jesus are doing more Jesus-type work than the church.
because the system has convinced us that salvation has nothing to do with streets, just our souls. Fountain of life, would you pray with me for just a moment that God will begin to awaken us, that he has called us to bring people out of captivity, out of bondage, and to not just feed people, but to create systems so that people don't need feeding. Would you pray that God would begin to elevate our thinking so that we begin to understand that we need his power to be this effective in the world? And can I tell y'all something? The world is not going to hate us because we preach Jesus, beat tambourines, and speak in tongues. The world is going to hate us because we're going to break its bank by freeing folks, by freeing folks who are being prostituted out of their poverty, their homelessness, the lack of education. And while we begin to touch those who God would sit with and have dinner with, his power is going to begin to fall. Not because I say so, but because scripture says so. For just a moment, and for whatever reason, you just need God, you just need someone just to agree with you in prayer. We're going to, we've got folks that are standing against the walls who can pray with you. But for whatever reason, God's giving you insight or wisdom or you want God to give you strategies to be part of solutions. I want to say one more thing before we pray for just a moment. Thank you all for being patient. Particularly my folks of European descent. Can you all just look at me for just a minute? And a mistake that the church has made is that we've talked about whiteness and not helped you to understand that we're not talking about your skin color or your ethnicity. And we have allowed attacks to be launched against you and your personhood and not the spiritual principle that pits people against each other. This message is not to beat down my white brothers and sisters. It is to liberate you to understand it is a system that God hates. It's a system that makes me angry, but I'm not mad at my brothers and sisters who have been snagged by this system. Because you've got a role to play in preaching truth. And like I've told you all, like I've told you all, in a few months we're going to come back up here again and dismantle what we as men have allowed to happen against women and sisters and prophets and prophetesses and evangelists and leaders in the church we have silenced for Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We're on a limping gospel because we have not been able to hear the truth through folks who make up 70% of the church. How can you silence the prophets and then say, speak, Lord, your servant is hearing? How can we do that? But I'm trying to set us free. I want us to understand that when we come together, we're not just being cool and eclectic. We are kicking off centuries-old strongholds and saying, I need you, 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 I need you. There's actually studies that say don't do what we're doing because this makes church growth difficult. What is numerical growth and the people inside the building loathe each other and don't even have the grace or space to say why. Liberty is dropping on the house of God. Liberty is dropping on the house of God. So I want you all to understand this is your church. This is our gospel. This is our message. These songs are our songs. Folks on the wall, as I pray in just a moment, will you just extend your hands towards the congregation? Not that people want or can't come, but this is just what I just want to press today. In our generation, we're going to watch God begin to turn this around. I'm telling you, once we grasp this, we begin to love each other, and we begin to reach out to those that are pressed outside, Fountain of life, 
That's the revival we've been praying for. That's the renewal. Almost every church is praying for the renewal, but then don't want to follow the recipe. You can't have a sweet potato recipe and you don't have sweet potatoes. It's responsible. That's called a chess pie or something. Folks want a renewal for a revival. And renewal comes by understanding the enemy has tried to pit us against each other. He is oppressed, folks, because he knows God's hand is on them. And when those who have been blessed come to lift up those who are oppressed, the power of God falls on them as well. We are not going to reach out to the city, county, and the world because we pity them because God will make us stronger and better. God, we extend our hands to the people of God and thank you for the grace and the space to be the people of the Lord. And Lord, I think that even though I struggle and I've got to preach and teach these things, you are revealing to us that the enemy has built systems to oppress your people so that your glory cannot come. But I declare in the name of Jesus that just as the sun is breaking through those clouds and piercing through these windows and spilling over this sanctuary, the grace and the glory of God is going to begin to fall upon this place. That God, you're going to allow us to bless and strengthen those that have been torn down and beaten down. And God, we do believe in personal responsibility, but that is balanced with the systemic reality of injustice. And God, the grace that breaks systemic racism tells the individual to rise up, take your mat and walk. So your grace does not, ex does not excuse anyone from personal responsibility. But personal responsibility does not overturn systemic reality. So God, give us both. Somebody say, God, give us both. Let your glory and your power fall. And as we extend our hands, let us become a place where the power of God is relevant, where the power of God is pumping and moving and seething, where the power of God is breaking, God, down strongholds. And God, those who have we realize that we've only been given it by you. And what keeps us from becoming eaten up by the system ourselves is saving and loving and sir, I don't mean saving, serving and loving those who are prey to the system. So God, my generosity in giving helps me to provide a ministry that breaks people out of poverty. My giving to this ministry provides teaching that breaks people out of systemic racism. So God, when we give our songs and we give our resources and we give our times and we invite our friends, God, you are using what we have to turn this world upside down. Fountain of life, be a fountain of life. Fountain of life, be a fountain of life. May the sweet waters of the glory of God, may the sweet waters of the justice of God flow to this community and flow to this region and flow to this nation and flow to this world. Not because we are good, not because we are special, not because we are eclectic, but because we are enlightened. The spirit of the Lord that shows up every time we gather is here to break systems. The spirit of the Lord is present to break systems. So bless Anthony Cooper and, and bless Aaron Hicks and, and bless Britt and bless my team at Nehemiah that's putting together a re-entry con re conference that is helping to break down the system, God. As the former Secretary of Corrections speaks at it in the panel, touch his heart and understand that he's written a good book, but he was a part of the system. And he did not speak out on that panel, but he's written a book about the injustice. Help us to not talk about it as an appendix or as an afterthought. But while we're in the midst of things, let us use our voices to speak up for you. Don't let, don't let the church forget its passion. Don't let the church forget its mission. Don't let the church forget its authority. I pray for the reentry work, the work for homelessness and the road homework that we do and the folks that are involved in therapy and, and, and education. I just pray God that there'll be an awakening in the city of God, awakening God in this place and awakening folks that we've got to break down these systems. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. And in doing so, you will bring souls to glory. You will give us the authority to speak to folks who are deaf to our message because we are deaf to their pain. 
How dare we expect them to listen to our God when we represent to them or misrepresent a God who doesn't give a care. God, you care, you care, you care. They threatened to kill Jesus because he said, I don't care about your religious aspirations. I'm here to set the captive free. I'm here to open the prison doors. I'm here to bring sons back to their mamas. I'm here to bring husbands back to their daughters. I'm here to bring people back together. I'm here to break the systemic reality that Satan has instituted to make one group or groups rise above others. I'm coming to get y'all ready for heaven because there's not going to be classes and caste systems and railroad tracks that divide people. The grace of our Jesus who is readying us for eternal life together is beginning by doing it on planet earth. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let us shake any message that does not honor you as God, does not honor mankind as being, humanity as being made in your image, does not honor your true power and your true purpose, God. You have given us power to set captives free and to rebuke and challenge systems. May we be a part of what you're doing to bring people back to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Come on, can we just praise the Lord for just a minute? Come on, come on. Can we praise God? There's a spirit of liberty that's coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Again, I want to reiterate this. Some of you, particularly our non-African American people, have been wondering, what's this barrier you're feeling? It's systemic reality. We don't know how to trust. We've never been able to let our guard down. We've been told through history, just trust, just trust, just trust. So we did stuff. We did stuff. It's not your fault, but those things keep us apart. The preaching of this truth is allowing that wall to come down so we can really begin to understand it's not you, it's not me, it's the cause of Christ. And we defeat the devil when we beat history and live out our future together. God is up to something. Please pray with me that God continues to bring unity to us. Pastor Kevin, come on, to bring unity to us as we do this, all right? Let's continue to pray for this. Take a moment and get your communication cards ready. Take a moment to get your offering envelopes ready. Take a moment to get all that together because um, it's time to go home. And we just want to honor God um, with our giving, with our generosity, our giving breaks us out of a system of greed. God has blessed us to be a blessing, so act like it today. Let's give generously, all right, to the cause of God, all right? Pastor Kevin's going to pray for you all in just a moment, but just take a moment and get that ready. And why don't you stand when your offerings are ready so that way he knows when to pray. <laughs>